Our next speaker disrupted India's hotel market when he began aggregating the long tail of budget properties under a single brand. And with $1 billion now in his arsenal from the SoftBank Vision Fund, he's plotting expansion across Asia and into Europe. Please welcome OYO's founder and CEO, Ritesh Agarwal. Ritesh, you know you're, you're, not the, um, you're not the youngest founder on center stage anymore. Sorry, I didn't hear that. But you're entirely. no longer the youngest, the youngest founder on center stage. <laughs> yeah, three years in a row. I think oh. uh, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful to be a part here at Focus Right. I keep telling that I have grown up publicly in the broader travel industry uh, with, with, with the Focus Right gang over the last few years. Been happy to have you. So Oyo is pretty prominent, I think, within Asia, but some of our attendees from elsewhere might just know you as someone who just raised a billion dollars and you know, something to do with hospitality. So uh, can you clarify what, what, is the, what is the business model now? Are you a hotel company, you're an OTA, what, what, what are you? So uh, hi guys, I'm Ritesh, I run Oyo Hotels. So Oyo's business model is actually quite straightforward. We believe worldwide, majority of the independent assets don't deserve to be treated as poorly as they do in comparison to the brands. So we have unique competencies of leasing and franchising the independent assets and renovating and operating them into full-scale uh, buildings. So we do it by a fulfillment-led model where we either lease, franchise, or manageize the full buildings uh, across. Today we manage close to 330,000 keys worldwide, uh, but still early days. So, and you started with a different model. So now you're, you consider yourself more of a hospitality brand. You started with a, more of a distribution company. And I think the, you, you went after the long tail of hotels in India, which I think was something like 80% of, of uh, supply and provided some basic branding, some distribution support, some tech. And what seemed so brilliant about that was that it was this asset light model that addressed the specific problem in India. It allowed you to expand quickly. Um, so why get away from, from that into this messy business of running hotels? Sure, no. As many of the people were there in the last year Focus Right uh, session where I was, I spent uh, 30 minutes last year sp speaking about uh, my view about why having a full-scale asset, in fact, this is up on the slide. On the left is how all the hotels look like. On the right is what we convert them into. It is the real before and after. My view is, uh, when, even when we started Oyo Hotels, the mission was very straightforward, that there is a 20-room building right by the subway station, which can effectively become a place where a common man can go and have a great quality living space experience. And to do that, over the years, we've learned about what competencies can enable it, whether they are competencies like our asset management, whether they're competencies like controlling the renovation, whether they're competencies like running our own 26 training institutes by which we send our general managers. Those have all been evolutions over the last few years. But from the year one, our model of saying that we want to create great quality living spaces for that small asset has remained, but we've gone more full stack than earlier. And the view we take is whatever gets higher yield for the asset owner and better quality of experience for the customer, we will keep doing that. And even if it means going deeper in the year, coming years, Was we quality will make that. control a problem with the old model? Is that one of the reasons for a change? So from our perspective, uh, the view was for asset owners to know how renovation works uh, by hiring general contractors themselves, for asset owners to be able to get training through the general manager, for asset owners to manage pricing, revenue management, and so on, were all very complicated challenges. Uh, whenever we see a challenge, a lot of companies see that challenge and say, wow, this industry is so broken, I don't want to be doing this. Whenever we see a challenge, we start salivating. We say, wow, this is something that we're going to go and fix. So that's what we've been doing over the last few years. And uh, thankfully so, uh, this has shown great results and quality. Our first quarter repeat, like the customers that come this quarter, mm. in the coming quarter, two years back, we used to get 15% customers, which is not bad in a low-frequency business like travel. But nowadays, that's 28%. And 90% of our revenue is either repeat or of word of mouth. So we've seen great results of quality impact uh, by being more and more full stack. 
Okay, and so you started in India, where again, 80% of hotels are independent, and then, and then went into Indonesia and Malaysia, which are also pretty fragmented, and you had competitors there pretty quickly. What, what's your advantage over, over locals? So, uh, to begin with, I think we welcome as many players as possible with a view of saying that if you see across the world, roughly 80% of the assets are actually unbranded, whether it is the Paddington in London, or Bayswater in London, or China, or Indonesia, or uh, Italy, any of these countries. From our perspective, the more of us come together, the more we can renovate all of these buildings and make them accessible for common man. But that said, I think our view is our unique competencies are the four things I just mentioned. We have over a thousand civil engineers who can renovate assets faster than anyone else. We have one of the most uh, sophisticated asset leasing systems by which we can predict what lease generates the best yield for the property. We have close to 13,000 assets we manage and just 30 revenue managers who run them, whereas traditional hotels, for every hotel, they hire a revenue manager. So a bunch of these competencies, coupled with local market understanding, uh, is, is the two things that we feel is unique about us. So you've also named the UK as, uh, as, as a country that you're going into. There's a pretty good supply of budget brands there. Um, it's not in Asia, so I'm trying to figure out, is it, do you have a girlfriend in, there, in the UK, or what's, what, why, why are you, do you think that market? So look, I think, uh, uh, by the way, that, <laughs> that's a yes. Okay, all right, let's talk about China now. No, I think I must talk about Britain. <laughs> all right, all right. So look, I so, think, <laughs> I think, uh, look, uh, we, we are very excited about Britain, uh, and I must talk about our first asset uh, in Britain, which was in Sussex Gardens. It was 60% occupancy before we went in. After Oyo Hotels franchised it, it's now 95% occupancy on an average. The reason is, in Sussex Gardens, there are this huge queue of hotels in Paddington, there's some in Bayswater near the uh, you know, uh, uh, park, and so on. All of these assets, operate at mediocre occupancies of 50 to 60 percent, whereas on the other hand, companies such as Premier Inn um, or Travel Lodge are operating at the highest occupancies ever. We feel that by means of affordability, worldwide, customers expect better quality living spaces for lower price, that's what Oyo brings, and on the other hand, we are able to yield better return for asset owners better than anywhere else. So you, you will see the small assets in US, and you will see them in Indonesia. It doesn't really matter, but Oyo takes a view of we want to only be in big, meaningful markets because we have to invest huge capacity in each of the markets that we operate in. So one big, meaningful market that you are aiming at is, is China. Again, a smaller share of independent properties, um, notoriously inhospitable to foreign startups, and you, I think we have a, a slide showing some of the numbers and hotel companies in, in China. And every time I've checked in with you, the number has gone up by 20,000 or something, the rooms that, you, that you've got. Um, you, you know, this would make you one of the biggest hotel chains in China. You've been in for a year. And those numbers, I have to say, defy credulity. It's, I can't look at that and see how that was possible within a year. So is there something I'm missing about what the model really is? So first off, look, uh, we are very thankful. You know, when I see this list uh, being on the top five, we will definitely be number four uh, by, by end of this year. Definitely. I think uh, we have then our shareholders, China Lodging, right above. That would make you about a third the size of Marriott. Yes. Yes. In China alone. <laughs> so anyway, uh, from our perspective, the view is... <laughs> so, uh, uh, but you know, I think not just keys, right? Like long term, we, we feel very confident that we would make uh, a significantly bigger impact worldwide. And the view is, this is the small hotels basically saying we will not just survive against the onslaught of the bigger hotel chains. We will thrive against all of them, and we will franchise and lease them to make that happen. But that said, three things that have helped us in China, and maybe will help the broader group here. We're still in our early days, long way to go. Uh, the first thing 
is OU op I have been traveling to China last four years, almost every, every month or alternative months. When we started in China, we said we will be the best copy of OYO hotels in China. We said we will not bring OYO hotels to China. That will be a mistake because a local entrepreneur who we compete with will copy OYO in China. So we might as well do that. So if, if that opportunity is really there in China, right, that's that massive and that good, there's a couple of companies I can think of. A core, this, you know, this type of thing I could see being uh, a, a fit for an Accor, and they are you know, yes. a, le a legacy uh, hospitality company. Sea Trip has not been shy about you know touching the, the su supply in, in yes, cruise success. and 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 hotel and air. So what uh, what do you think keeps those players from going after? Uh, so yes. actually, Acor is a part of the China Lodging because China Lodging is a franchise of uh, Acor. And you know, I have huge respect for Acor. Their CEO has been rapidly transforming that company in the last few years. But that said, I think from our view, uh, that is where the second and the third competencies are quite valuable. The second one is we have 5,300 team members in China who are working full time. This is not the hotel employees, right? The hotel employees are 60,000 additional. These are 5,300 people working every day to make sure that we can make our assets more efficient than anyone else. We feel very few people are as committed as we are to make a difference as large. And I think the last but not the least is the amount of uh, you know, effort we've put in. I believe sincerely in one story, which is every overnight success is at least a five-year-old story. Did you, I mean, in terms of, you know, you, clearly there's a lot of boots on the ground. In terms of technology, uh, did you have to build your own PMS for, for the Chinese market? So uh, we take a view of, like I said, we have two headquarters or two home markets, one of China and one of uh, India, which means that China, we have everything, like our separate CHRO, separate CTO, and so on. Our CTO used to lead technology for Mobike earlier, our China CTO. So yes, we've built... Uh, a lot of products uniquely in China for our Chinese patrons and asset owners, or we call them Lao Ban, uh, in China. So I believe you were the first Teal Fellow from India, yeah? And you've just secured a billion dollars in funding from the SoftBank Vision Fund. Uh, what, what do you think these, these sort of iconoclastic, deep-pocketed venture capitalists see in Ritesh Agarwal? Look, I think I've been very lucky. I was 19 when I became the first uh, Thiel Fellow. In short, got paid not to go to university. Uh, have grown older, now 24. But back then and now, I think there's been one thing that's consistent. I think the hunger for making a difference around ourselves. The Thiel Fellowship, I still remain, remember the contract saying, we never let university interfere with our education, because education is everywhere. Uh, university is just one way to get it. I think what they see is that there is this large potential opportunity uh, in the hotel market, which nobody is really seen or gone after with so much hunger and uh, authenticity. And when they see that kind of effort and the credibility that we've been building over the last few years, probably they feel like uh, supporting us. So we're almost out of time, but I am curious about the, the Vision Fund. I understand it's kind of a unique process. Can you talk a little bit about you know, who approaches who, at what point do you talk to Masa? Look, I think uh, in the history, uh, or probably our generation, Son Sen uh, is going to be one of the biggest visionary investors, is what I believe. He is, uh, in, like, he's thinking many years ahead of any one of us are, uh, and which is why he's as successful as he is. The Vision Fund, as far as I have operated with them, are looking at late stage or mature companies with meaningful returns or value accretion that they have created. And once the teams have done all the review, they've reviewed you on the ground, the teams come and stay at your hotels, they meet your teams, uh, and then, of course, Sonsan meets and makes the final decision. And very thankful to be a part of that family. And right. my travel family here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Ritash.